There she is. Hey, Christina. <laughs> You're muted. There we go. Hello, everybody. Hello. <laughs> I'm so glad to see you. Good to see you all, too. Oh, there's a big group. Yay. How's everybody doing? Are you like good? good. Like the silent, good, yeah, hanging in there. <laughs> Everyone muted responses, but heads shaking. Yes, <laughs> right. So everybody's. Like, are we all agreement that we're all over this? <laughs> Can we just make this virus go away, please? I would think we're all definitely there. Hey, yeah. y'all. What is the meeting ID? I'm on my phone and I want to get on my laptop, and oh. I couldn't. I couldn't get the meeting ID to work. Michelle? The ID of the past. Meeting ID, are you ready for it? Uh huh. Is 954 7585 That's what I put in. And let me see what it says. Oh, now it's letting me. Okay, I'm going to click off and I'll get on my laptop. Sounds okay. great. Thank okay. you, ladies. <laughs> hey, hi, Leanne. Uh -huh. Okay. All right. Well, it's it's six, and we are live on Facebook. Okay. Oh, we are. Oh, oh great. Okay. We are live on our Facebook page. <laughs> we are, Christina. We are. Oh, I'm glad that I wore something other than pajamas for you all then. So, yay. <laughs> yay for me. Yes, you look fabulous, and you know, pajamas are also acceptable. Thank you, thank you, right? We always joke with authors with doing the Zoom calls with book clubs, you know, that you have no idea what we're wearing, if we're wearing anything down below, <laughs> but, but for sure we are. It's just a matter of if it's pajama day or, you know, whatever. So I actually have real pants on today. It's kind of, kind of a big day for you all. I know you're excited. <laughs> we are, we are honored. Thank you. You're so welcome. And by the way, so this is my fashionable headband. Uh, it, what it really is doing is covering up all the gray because I haven't colored the hair in a very since whatever I don't know what's it been a year or so I have no idea it's all a time warp now at this point but yeah it was um I think it was a couple weeks ago I was about to zoom with a book club the next day and my I was facetiming with my mom who's down in California now and and uh, she looked and she goes you're gonna zoom with a book club she goes oh Chris you might want to wear a hat <laughs> Thanks, mom. <laughs> oh, perfect. Oh, oh, we're, how about a headband? <laughs> it's a little more subtle, you know. Let her know that we were, we approved. We were oh, just so you. glad that you are here, so. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> anyway. Well, I'm super glad to see everybody's faces here in their little squares tonight. I'm sure people will need to hop on and hop off and do as you please. We're all in a little virtual space, but Thank you for coming and m many of you or some of you may recognize me or remember me from other online discussions or posting in our Jayhawk book Facebook group, but I'm Leah Hallstrom. I facilitate the online discussions for the Jayhawk book club and I'm the communications coordinator at KU libraries. So I'm just so glad that I see a lot of returning folks and some new names here too for our discussion with Christina. Um, and I know we are all so excited that you are here and just hoping that you are doing well in Oregon. Yes. 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 And we have, you know, in Oregon right now, this is like, this is our season. It's summer. You know, we actually have sunshine. So we're pretty, we're pretty happy most days out here. Good. Well, I'm glad to hear it. So we'll take you away for an hour from the sunshine, but then we'll get you back out there. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, well, I was fortunate enough to talk with Christina earlier this summer when we selected Sold on a Monday. So I reached out to her in the hopes that she would be willing to come chat with us as we kind of wrapped up this summer selection. And she obviously said yes and is here today. Um, so I was able to kind of share with her a little bit about our group, which is now more than a thousand members. Um, and this is our sixth book selection together. So I kind of gave her the background that this book club is a collaborative effort between KU Libraries and the KU Alumni Association. And we just have a lot of fun because it can connect students and staff and faculty and alumni um, here in Lawrence and in Oregon and literally across the globe. So we've had a really good time and we're gonna keep on trucking. 
Um, so you'll hear me tonight reference a lot of like, I saw this on Facebook. So just so everybody is aware, no matter what platform you're kind of engaging with, uh, most of our conversations take place on our private Facebook page. So members can post um, questions, and respond to thoughts that others have shared. So that's our main, our main piece. So if you hear me saying that now, now you know. Um, and typically at the end of our, our book club, we get together for those who are local um, and can kind of meet up and talk about the book. So obviously with our current state of affairs, we are glad that these virtual chats can fill, fill that void and we can all feel, feel a little bit of togetherness here tonight. So um, with all of that out of the way, Michelle, She's right here for me. Hello. Um, our partner at the Alumni Association is going to share a couple of tech-related things, and then we will get started. Yep. So if everybody can kind of stay muted, unless you are asking a question, that way we don't have background noise and echoing or anything like that. Um, we are. We have let's see, 25 people in here. A few people have been kind of jumping on and off. Um, we currently have 25 on the Zoom meeting, and we have uh, 10 watching live on Facebook. So people who um, did not want to get on Zoom, we also told them they can post comments on Facebook um, and we'll ask on their behalf. So Christine, we might ask a few questions or I will ask on their on people's behalf on Facebook um, if they have questions on there. So um, I think that's really it. And I, by the way, I'm Michelle Lang, uh, Director of Alumni Programs for the KU Alumni Association. So we just uh, are really grateful for all of you guys participating in the book club and hope you enjoy this um, discussion. All right, thank you, Michelle. So, yep, if you're putting questions or comments here in our Zoom chat, we're going to be monitoring those. So feel free to toss anything up at any time and we'll either get a, get to them as they come or we'll get there at the end. So, um, Christina, I did share the book club event guide with our group. So we have a mix of martinis or sidecars or whatever <laughs> people would want. So that helped with the pandemic too just so you know yeah <laughs> enough of those sidecars they'll kill anything <laughs> yes, we were everyone was very excited so that was a really neat thing that we got to share but um i know that you've got a great story about how you kind of started your career as an author and i love the title of that story too so if you want to kick things off with that i think we would love to hear it absolutely and if you don't mind would you all mind if i take a quick screenshot of you all if, if you can raise your objection now, because <laughs> otherwise I'll forget. Sometimes I've got, I'm like, oh, I should have grabbed a photo. Okay, here we go. We'll do this really fast, right? Everybody smile, yay. Oh yeah, if you hold your book, that'd be even better. Cheese. Oh, wait a minute. It didn't work. Hold on one sec. We'll try one more time. Okay, technical difficulties. Here we go. There we go. Okay. Perfect, got it. Thank you. Okay, right. so let's see here. Let me go full screen here. Tell you all better. Um, yeah, so my journey as the accidental author is what I call it. So I think, Leah, did I share any of this with you before? I'm not sure that I did. I think we touched on it briefly, but I'm intrigued to hear more. Okay, so if you haven't heard kind of the background of how I became an author, um, the way I stumbled into it, I am so envious of the author friends of mine who said, you know, I always knew, I knew from since I was in a second grade, or you heard all, all these stories, right, where they, you know, wrote their first sad little novel in third grade, and, you know, about, you know, getting bullied over a lollipop, you know, and, and um, with me, no, I had no idea that I had any plans at all to become a creative writer. Um, it was, a hand, I say a handful of years ago, I guess it keeps getting, that handful gets bigger every year, but it was about, I was pregnant with my second child, with Kiernan, so what I say with this, of any moms who know who have been pregnant before, you know, or been around pregnant women, you know that we are high on hormones. And I was creating life. So a book suddenly didn't seem so hard. <laughs> I am not saying this um, to be joking. I actually, this is actually what my mentality was at the time. So I was barely a reader at the time, which I hate sharing that, especially during speeches at libraries. I feel like I'm going to get hit by lightning any second for admitting that, um, but I've obviously done an enormous amount of catching up since then. I read about a book a year, which is silly, and, uh, and instead, but I was always a really big movie buff. So I grew up in the TV industry. I started hosting a kid's TV show for an ABC affiliate when I was nine years old, and I hosted that show for about five or six years. So I grew up in the newsroom which is obviously very relevant with this book in particular. 
So every Wednesday night, I would go to the station and we would film the show and we were slotted in between the end of the six o'clock news and the beginning of the 11 o'clock news. So we would shoot our show and then we were told to sit around and wait and find out if anything needed to be reshot. And that was our one chance because it aired then on the weekend. So I would sit around with the anchors and the sports casters and, and the reporters and they became friends of mine, um, even at, sorry, at nine years old. And the best person, my favorite person to this day was the weatherman because Mr. David Apple used to give me the special pen and I could move the clouds around. So I thought that was very, very high tech and cool. So being that um, my childhood was there, obviously that influenced what I, you know, the, the view, uh, the point of view I wanted to take for this book in particular. And then from there, I'll, I'll circle back to that as far as this book goes. But as far as my journey goes, I ended up visiting my grandmother who lives up in Washington on the Hood Canal. It's my, my mother's mother. Iowa farm girl grew up on the farm where she would, you know, get the eggs from the chickens, milk the cows every morning before walking literally eight miles to school. You know, so of course my kids chime in with uphill both ways <laughs> in a snowstorm naked. Yes, so that was grandma. And, um, and we're Irish too, by the way. So our stories get better every time we tell them. And so when I went to visit her, when I was pregnant with my second child, I decided to create a cookbook for the grandchildren for Christmas that year and thought, I'll put a little biographical section about her life in it. I thought the grandkids would enjoy that full of, and then the rest of it full of her recipes. Well, that ended up inspiring me because she ended up sharing, of course, her letters from my late grandfather, whom I was very close to, but did not realize until that point that they'd only dated twice during World War II, exchanged letters the entire time, fell in love through those letters, and then he came home on leave uh, from World War II from the Navy. They got married, were married for 50 years until he passed away. And then she said, would you like to see the letters? So that seemed like a trick question. Yes, grandma, I'd like to see those letters very much. And my mother didn't even know that she had them until that point. And we asked grandma, of course, I may have shared this with you before, Leah. We said, grandma, why didn't you share this with anyone? Like, why wouldn't you tell us? Well, nobody ever asked. So, and that's the greatest generation for you, of course, as you all know, very, very humble. And so we spent the afternoon pouring over those beautiful wrinkled letters from a 19 year old sailor who didn't know if he'd be coming home tomorrow. And even my mom didn't know how poetic he was. You know, he was an Iowa farm kid that, you know, at 10th grade, right, they're done and they start working the farms and had no idea he could write as beautifully as he did. And so from there, I left her house thinking, wow, I'd make a really good movie. You know, I think I may have told you it was, I thought, it's like the notebook meets Saving Private Ryan. <laughs> and I'm like, and what if the soldier fell in love through letters, but it's a different girl writing back? How would you know who you were truly in love with? I thought, it's like Match.com of 1940s. <laughs> you can kind of put whatever photo you want up and, and maybe fudge it a little bit in your bio, you know? So I thought, you know, how would you know who you really were truly in love with in those letters? How well can you, you know, especially if there was any deception that was involved in the letters. So essentially it was um, Cyrano de Bergerac set during World War II. And I left her house thinking, wow, this is, that's a movie I would go see. You know, so that's how it all started. And only, like I said, because I was high on hormones and crazy, um, I thought, no, I'm going to write this as a novel, you know, because, you know, I'm like, hey, if Nicholas Sparks could do it, why can't I? So, you know, because it's so easy. Um, and so I sat down, very uh, blissfully ignorant, had no idea what I was getting myself into, no idea um, that it wasn't just like writing a screenplay, because, you know, watching a million movies. And I thought, oh, I'll just write it like what I see in my head which is still what I do, but you know, hopefully better than that first draft of that very sad book. Um, and so that's, I ended up learning I needed to research, of course, as you all know, an enormous amount. Um, research helps when you write historical fiction. Note to all of you, if you decide to write it. Um, yeah, you probably know that already. So I ended up learning so much and having so much respect for the greatest generation, um, not just because obviously they were all kids that won that war, not just the, the boys, but obviously the women who fought so courageously and served in like the Women's Army Corps and were told when they got home to mothball their uniforms and not put it on their resume because they would not be hired for a job because there were questionable things they may have done to, you know, raise the morale of those troops. I mean, it was, you know, it was pretty terrible what would happen to a lot of those women. So I got to put all those things into a novel. And from there, um, I thought, you know, I, I, 
of course, went through many, many drafts, thank goodness, before the book sold, lots of rejection letters. And every time I got a rejection, I would be bummed, of course, for a few minutes, because that's, it stings. And then I immediately sent out two more submissions on the very same day. And the reason I share that is because that applies, of course, to for all of us in a lot of capacities of our lives. And I definitely share that with aspiring writers, especially when I talk to schools. I always then had twice as much hope on that day than I had disappointment. And I figured as long as I just kept trying to make the book better and improving my craft and learning, I still felt I had a good story in it. I just need to learn how to tell it better, that it would be ready the best it could be when I finally got an acceptance letter to read the whole book. And so that became my first published book, Letters From Home. And it was a two book contract. So I will tell you that um, I was never planning to write two books. <laughs> It was supposed to be the one book and that was going to make a movie and I was going to be, you know, famous and glorified. Yeah, all that and walk the red carpet and then there was never going to be a second book. So that is not how it played out. So I got the blessing of getting a second, a two book contract and after panicking, decided to brainstorm ideas. And I'll just tell you briefly um, that my mom and I remembered, thank goodness for her, that a family friend had shared that he had served for the US while his brother served for Japan. And I thought, wow, what an incredible brother story that would be. So I started re researching that. And what I found was that there was this very obscure fact that I found that roughly 200 non-Japanese spouses lived in the internment camps voluntarily. They wouldn't be separated from their children and their spouses. Now, in at least 30 states at the time, it wasn't even legal for Japanese and and you know, Caucasian Americans to be married. And I know that because um, I'm half Japanese, my dad's from Kyoto. So I thought that really hit home for me. So next thing you know, I'm writing a book about that. And then from there, you know, I just keep coming across nuggets of history that I think, wow, how did I not know this? People need to know this. So they've been everything from finding out there's Nazi saboteurs who were dropped off by a U-boat on the East Coast of America in 1942 and had an incredible story in the US that I thought this has to go into it. This is like a movie I have to put into a book. And that's the pieces we keep. And right now, long journey, if anything, actually comes to fruition, but producers have, have optioned the film rights to it. Screenwriters got attached about two weeks ago. So you never know, something exciting could happen out of that. Um, and then from there, it was The Edge of Lost, which when I found out there were kids who grew up on Alcatraz Island as family of the prison staff and were not supposed to mix with the inmates, but secretly some of them did. That is just literary gold right there. So that pulled me into the 1930s. And that's where I became really fascinated with that era and with gangsters and the speakeasies. And I mean, it's just such you know, an interesting time period. Um, and especially when you find out that gangsters at the time, the mobsters, you know, even were very entrenched into the business community and not only the business community, but also with journalism, finding out that sometimes they would give tips to the journalists. And I figured they weren't giving them tips just out of the kindness of their heart. You know, <laughs> there's probably something in it for them or against somebody that would be very convenient. So that all, of course, made its way into this book as well. And that catches you all up to Sold on a Monday. And the reason I came across that, of course, as you probably know from the author's note, is that when I found out, you know, when I, I was online writing the Alcatraz book, actually, and when I found that, you know, that there was that, that photo popped up online when I saw a clickbait that says, you know, 50 of the most shocking historical photos you have never seen, you know, <laughs> admit it, you better all nod that you've all clicked on that, Because right? <laughs> you're like, what photo have I never seen? So of course, as a historical author, I click. And because you think, especially as a writer, there might be a good story in there somewhere. And um, usually not, usually we've seen most of them or they're crazy, you know, and you have to get past a thousand ads to see all the photos. But, but I'm glad I clicked that day because of course I saw that photo of the kids that were on their own stoop, apartment stoop in Chicago, uh, which I thought, if you've seen the photo, you know, in the back of the book, it probably a lot of you, I'm sure the same, assumed it was the Great Depression. It looked very much like, you know, migrant mother. And instead it was 1948, which surprised me. You know, I think we think of post-World War II as being very often a parade-filled, you know, very prosperous time for the country, and it not, obviously wasn't for everybody. Um, with the mother turned away from the camera, seemingly in shame, and that sign that reads, four children for sale, inquire within, I just, it stopped me in my tracks. I, I bookmarked the photo. I kept coming back to it. You know, this is what historical authors do, right? We, we see a photo or 
something from history that disturbs us, we don't then swipe. We go, let's save it and put it on our desktop and keep revisiting it because I thought it just kept pulling me back. And I could not understand why of how a mother could not just give up her children, hopefully for their betterment, but to actually ask for money in return. And when I brought that up at an author's breakfast, you know, we were all talking, we're friends, and we're talking about what are you working on next? And, and I said, I'm obsessed with this photograph. It seems like a novel because I want to tell this story. But number one, it's so depressing. And number two, I thought it also seemed like, and I'm sure some of you would, might think that from looking at the cover, since a lot of the kid covers sort of on the, on the cover might, think you, might make you think of like a, a Orphan Train by my friend Christina Baker Klein. I'm sure you probably all read that. And, and now my other friend is Lisa Wingate. We're all writing like sad children's stories, apparently. Lisa Wingate wrote Before We Were Yours. And so when you look at those kind of books and you think, you know, I thought I could write this from the kid's point of view. That was my original thought was that they were sold, they were separated, and then they're trying to find each other again. And that seemed like the most obvious choice. But I also felt like it was just orphan trained too with the fact that there was a photo involved. And I didn't think that I was bringing anything new to the table really. And it wasn't until I started researching the photo more and the true story behind these kids and the family, finding out that she did have a baby after the photo went viral, as we call it today, ran in about 10 different states. Uh, people were sending in donations and uh, some cases money and offering jobs, et cetera. And come to find out later I learned that the mother was turning most of it down. And I can explain more of what's not in the book, actually the true story, that was pretty shocking. But when I found that out, I thought, you know, this is it's an interesting story when they had one mention in that follow-up article, and that was that some family members claimed the photo was staged. Mm -hmm. So when I heard that, I thought, okay, now that's interesting. Because the kids were, were all given away or sold, all five of them, but not until almost two years after that photo was published. And so I thought, it made me wonder with the sign that was so perfectly painted, it even had accent marks on the letters. And then I thought, what if one came before the other? Now that doesn't change, of course, as I told you before, Leah, it doesn't change what happened to these kids. Uh, it doesn't change the horrible circumstances that almost all of them faced afterwards. But it did make me wonder which one prompted the other. And it could be that the mother had a horrible sign, you know, that, that basically said the same thing, but maybe was, would not photograph well. And maybe somebody, you know, maybe a reporter painted it to make it show up better in a photograph. Who knows what the true story is? But the oldest girl in the photo named Rayanne, she's the one in the little white dress. And uh, she and I became friends after the, you, you put the photo back there? Yeah. So she and I became friends after uh, I wrote the book. And we ended up connecting and she's, we become good friends. And she asked me, can we call this our book? And I said, of course it's our book, Rayanne. Um, and we'll probably touch on it later but of course we're you know kind of on a joint mission together to try to help something from her past right now so um so that sort of brings you up to speed of where the idea came from as far as it being from a reporter's point of view instead of from the children's point of view and i thought how interesting would it be if if this reporter took a photo and didn't mean for it to have the consequences it did you know sort of our unintended consequences of our actions and what if he took the photo not even meant for publication and yet the domino effect that it causes is something that I find fascinating because I think that can happen, things like that can happen in so many parts of our lives that we don't realize. Yeah, I think that's a nice point. And I, we had posed the question in our Facebook group, like I think maybe our very first question, um, asking kind of what people's initial reactions were to specifically Ellis and Lily, and if those changed over time in someone, I'm not sure, who all is here, but Linda Bayer, one of our members, um, wrote something and I thought it was really thought provoking. So I kind of want to share that and then um, follow it up with a question. So Linda said, uh, when I started the book, it had an old fashioned feeling about it. At first I chopped the characters up as unethical, but thinking about this after I finished, I thought how easy it is to be judgmental. They were young, both needed jobs, and sometimes you do the wrong thing thinking that you were doing right. So it kind of just got me thinking about how the era influenced their behaviors like you were just saying. Maybe it was a different time or if we all think, Christina, if you think that 2020 
Lily and Ellis would have made the same choices today? Right. I, I think that's a good question. And I, you know, I, I think that's, it's, I think we are just, and I'm, I know I'm guilty of it as well. We're, especially with the information coming at us so quickly today, it's hard to keep up, right? We all agree on this. The, and the snippets of information and the clips of news and the headlines that we can make assumptions and a photograph that we can make an assumption. I've seen people, you know, with a photograph and then people just uh, piling on. And yet when you learn the context, sometimes that changes everything. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the same today, even more so maybe than ever, um, but how quick we can be to judge without understanding the whole circumstance. And, you know, and even after we know the circumstances, you know, can we really all stand there and judge that person so harshly and, and be right with that? Um, I think the time period though, of course, absolutely. And, and you know, affects how Ellis and Lily, um, how, how they acted. And I've been asked that before, since the real photo was 1948, why did I set it during the Great Depression? And that is exactly the answer, because to me that that also makes it a little more understandable why they would do the things they they do. I think they're good people. Good people don't always make, as we all know, the best decisions. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the circumstances help influence that. And so I thought if you put them post World War Two, when we typically, whether we should or not, think of that as a prosperous time for everybody, mm -hmm. um, handing out GI bills and jobs and everything else, would we see them the same? for the choices they made than if they made it during the Great Depression. When people, just like now, huge unemployment today, of course, I mean, the parallels are crazy, um, but does that mean everybody was poor? Does that mean nobody was shopping? Does that mean nobody had a job? No, absolutely. There are still always people making more money than they should, you know, or et cetera, or doing still okay. And, um, and I think so, but nobody wants to lose what they have, especially during a tough time that you can't just change jobs. Um, you know, on a whim. And so I think for Ellis, having him sort of making his, you know, backroom deals as far as his raises and all of those things, almost everything in this book are based on true stories. Almost everything, as crazy as some of it is. Um, so with him making those deals behind, you know, sort of bringing some scotch or whatever he did, you know, to make a deal to get a raise, all of that stuff is true. So he, um, he was making pretty good money. And for somebody that really was less about the money as he was about feeling successful, about feeling like he was worthy and for feeling, you know, like he had a dad then that maybe didn't, especially think for the males, you know, and specifically during that time period to not feel like he had something tangible to show his dad that I'm good enough, you know, that I am a success, um, that you thought the wrong thing about me to, you know, to finally be seen was huge for him. And that to me was more important than, than really the money he was making or his job. But once he had that, he didn't want to let it go. Right. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, kind of, you touched on it for a second there, but someone, Laura in the chat said, uh, how did you research the newsroom conditions of the time period, especially if you know they're all from real examples? Yeah, so a lot of it was research um, for sure, like everything from the mafia to journalism. Um, I read a couple books that were about the Herald Tribune during that time period. And so some of those stories were just fantastic. You know, the, the lines that people would form that were everything from, you know, pastors or priests or public publicists or mafia or whatever would kind of line up and talk to the editor and give their tips for the day. Um, going up in the elevator, you know, right, where the elevator operator somehow always ended up a foot too high or a foot too low. Remember that part? Like, you can't make that stuff up. I mean, that was just good. That all came from real stories. And I thought that's funny, you know, that somehow they said the lift operator never ended up even. Um, and you walk in and it was just that cloud of smoke that we can all imagine during that time period. And, you know, and the typing, typing, the clacking of those typewriters that are the old fashioned typewriters and, and all their phones ringing and, you know, that are all like the candlestick phones, you know. And, um, so a lot of that was from, yeah, from reading other people's books and memoirs about their time as, as reporters. Very cool. Thank you. And thank you, Laura, wherever you are out there. <laughs> um, so I guess, let's see, skipping, skipping ahead a little bit. Um, one of our other members left something in, in the chat here. Let's see. Um, oh, uh, you touched on it on one of your other books, but one of our members, Lori, said, quote, um, it was an absolutely amazing read, and I think they should make this into a movie. 
So, so if Soul <laughs> was going to be turned into a movie, I'm sure you've never thought about this before, but if you were to consider who might play some of these roles, do you have some standouts? And I would love to see people in the chat if you thought about someone too, to pop those in, so. Oh my gosh, yes. If you have the ideas, please um, <laughs> tell me, but then definitely tell Spielberg because I'm sure he wants to hear from all of us. Um, yeah, it, it is with a film agent and there has been interest here and there that comes every once in a while and, and they sort of, you know, run through all of those. So um, nothing too exciting yet to, to announce, but you never know. Um, it would be nice. What's cool about um, what's happening right now with all the streaming is that before historical historical um, novels and historical movies had to have a very hard time being made, as you can imagine, because they cost so much more. Mm -hmm. uh, when you have, especially with me, right? I write World War II. So I've had lots of, you know, I've been optioned before in this and that, but nothing had come to fruition, largely because I was told over and over because the budgets have to be so high. Um, you're looking at, especially when you have, you know, things like, you know, you know, B-17s, you know, somehow cost money and um, tanks and explosions and, um, and all the clothing and dressing up the streets to be in the cars to go all the way back in time. So of course those cost more. Um, having armies apparently cost more. So, uh, so the good news is, you know, going into the thirties, you notice my cast is getting smaller and smaller. Um, and so I, so we'll see what happens. Um, there is a lot more interest as you've all seen in historicals lately in TV shows and films um, because of the streaming process. It just, a lot more people are able to make these historical films that BBC has it down with science. You know, I mean, it's, it's amazing. So it's pretty exciting for a lot of the historical authors. So a lot of options are happening right now because of it. So we'll see. Yeah, that is very neat. You'll have to keep us posted. I will, I will. <laughs> have a <lot> party. <laughs> yes, exactly, that would be nice. Um, so Vernell in the chat says, so I guess during your research and things you might've seen, um, once connected with the mafia, could a news person get out of that relationship? That is a good question. I'm not sure. I, I would imagine that would be hard. <laughs> you know, I think that is unfortunately not all that different from today. So I imagine that connections, you know, powerful people and you get into connections with, as we're all seeing today in politics and everything else, um, I think that's, you know, across the aisle, you know, and, um, you know, having things that are held over your head, the favors that you do in some capacity somehow, you know, they circle back around and I, I would imagine that would be difficult, yes. Um, the things I wrote in the, in the novel about like the black hand, for example, you know, the kind of um, extortion that, so they called themselves the black hand and would leave notes and they put a little, they draw hand on it. Um, that was all true. Um, that one I came across when I wrote The Edge of Lost. So when, and by the way, um, if, if you have read that or if, if you haven't, um, just know that there's some minor characters that are actually shared between both books because as I was writing Sold on a Monday and writing mobsters and this and that in the time period, and I thought, why am I creating new people when they already existed during that time period? So in the edge of loss, some of those people are, I created them there. And, um, and this is, but Sold on a Monday, the time period is earlier. So it's kind of fun. I got to almost make them younger in, in this story and then got to see where they ended up in the next one, which was sort of backwards, but was fun. That is very neat. <laughs> so um, obviously, Lily and Alice come out. We talk about them a lot. They seem to be the main characters. Um, and I think it was easy for us all. I think we all recognized that they made mistakes and some, some sketchy choices. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it was easy to say that the millstones here were really enemies in this story. Um, but I think they both were struggling with things that were bigger than themselves. So what, how do you classify that those two. So with the millstones, um, I will say, yeah, I mean, there was a time I remember probably a year ago, I talked to a book club and they said, you know, who, who was your least favorite character? You know, who's somebody you didn't like? I go, oh, well, you know, so, and I think I, I threw out one and they said, really? They were shocked. Really? Not the millstones? I go, oh my gosh, I forgot about him. Yes. Okay. Um, oh, wait. Oh, millstones. Okay. Hold on. I'm sorry. I mixed them up because, sorry, I haven't read the book in a while. Um, I was thinking of the, um, Oh, what, it starts with a G. Actually, it's the farmers. Oh, um, the gantries. Thank you. Yeah, the gantry. They, I, they brought up the gantry. I go, oh, yeah, they, yeah, they were bad. Um, so, but I understood where everybody came from. You know, so the way that I try to write all my characters, that they're not just a pure villain, you know, that, that is horrible and we all hate him and he's, he's you know, he's, um, even like if you think of Hunger Games, right? You know, the, you know, we've got President Snow. 
it's, I still find them fascinating because it's not just pure evil. You, they're bad, um, but they have their reasons that they be believe that they are still the hero of their own universe. They, they understand, like, you know, Thanos, for example, right? I mean, they know why they're doing what they're doing. Um, and they believe it's righteous in their own universe. So, so I find that more fascinating than just making someone pure evil. And the millstones, see, and I didn't think that they were necessarily bad people. Um, they, you know, I, I could understand this mother who at the time would not be diagnosed, of course, she would just have the blues, right? So, but she was completely depressed and obviously needed help and, when her husband is just trying to solve. And if you see a, you know, a photograph in the newspaper of two kids that apparently aren't wanted, um, then you think, you know, that it looked like they're being sold, you know, and you think, oh my gosh, and she looks just like the daughter they lost. Doesn't that seem like a good fit, you know, and, and made his wife happy again and brought her back to the world. And, you know, so I, I felt like everybody was sort of making choices, you know, that they thought was serving their world the best. Um, obviously she needed help. So I think that's what I saw in her more than a bad person. I just thought she really, you know, she made terrible choices, obviously harmful to children and obviously to Ellis, but, um, but it wasn't out of evilness as much as she was just, I think, very confused and hurting. Yeah. And Brian wrote here in the chat that he spent m much of the book thinking it was two mothers trying to get their children back only to realize that it was three mothers, including Sylvia. Yes. That is absolutely true. Yeah, and on a very kind of um, darkly funny note, I will share with you all the idea for her of kind of dressing her up, you know, and how, how disturbing that would be, right? I mean, that you have a child then that looks just like the one you lost, I can't imagine, you know, and, um, and how then when, because she's not completely well, how tempting it would be as she's giving her her clothes you know, because that's what she had on hand still. And because obviously she wouldn't get rid of those, those clothes and to have her dressing up as her. And then you just cut her hair and then suddenly your daughter is back. Um, and so I thought, you know, so, so you've got that, but I will, I will say, <laughs> especially knowing this is live stream, I'm a little bit hesitant to share this, but I'll just share. All between us, you know, and nobody else. Um, so my, where the idea came from with that is that my, uh, my husband's late grandparents, uh, yeah, late grandparents were very, very sweet, um, Iowa couple, and they decided, they grew up actually like five miles away from my grandparents, just coincidentally. We didn't know that until the, um, until the rehearsal dinner of our, of our wedding, which is crazy. Their high schools went against each other and everything. It was, it was not small world. So uh, my husband says, everybody has relatives from Iowa they don't want to admit to. <laughs> And I say that in complete joking and love. Um, so ended up, so his grandparents had um, a little dog and I, his name was Sambo and it was a Scotty, super cute Harrier. And after Sambo lived a very long life and passed away, they bought another uh, Terrier, uh, exact same one, another Scotty. And um, which is n not weird at all, right? I mean, you love a breed, except they named him Sambo. <laughs> And not Sambo too, you know, just Sambo. And then after he died, they bought another one and they also named him Sambo. So. Oh no. So they kind of pretend that, you know, so everybody understood why, even though it was a little bit, it was one of those things he said, you didn't talk about in the family. It was a little bit weird. Um, so <laughs> I hate to tell you this truth, but this is where the idea came from. So I thought, oh yeah, this is kind of like Sambo. So yeah, that, that's where the idea came from. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I'm learning that now instead of while I was reading because now I think I could only picture the little terrier, so. Yeah, it might be a little bit, you know, funnier than it should be as you're reading the book. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> oh, thank you for sharing. Don't, <laughs> don't worry, it's a private Facebook group. Oh, yeah, it. totally <laughs> private. <laughs> I think they'd even giggle about it now, you know. For sure, Dan, my husband's parents think it's funny, you know. We always, we kind of giggle about it. <laughs> So one of our other members, Beth Blankenship, um, said that the book, quote, ended before it answered all my questions. Mm -hmm. And she also noted that that was okay with her. Sure. Um, but in the book club guide, uh, there's a question posed about how readers might envision the characters after the story ends and then even five years after that point. So this may be a, a sequel spoiler, but 
do you do you write it thinking about a future for them or was that kind of just the end for you so the way that i write all of my novels is that um i i don't like everything tied up neatly because i always figure it that life started book for these characters before the book started and it goes on after and uh, but i hope that the way i end it is that it is hopefully satisfying um and that all of the characters have grown in some way. So I've also been asked, you know, how I felt about like the publishers putting um, uh, putting Calvin on the cover, who, who turns out to be Calvin. You know, you obviously don't know that when you start the novel um, versus like a reporter, for example. And I, to me, you know, the kids really were the catalyst for everybody else growing in the story. Otherwise, without them, this, they, the characters would be the same when they started in the book and pretty much the same when they ended with the book, except maybe some career changes and that's about it. Um, so how I envision them afterwards is, I, I felt like everybody was, grew by the end, you know, except, you know, except, and even, even Sylvia Millstone, right, is now finally getting the help that she needs. So I, I thought all of that was, um, I, I really liked where everybody ended up at the end of the story. I thought they were, they grew as people, they were better people, they understood each other more, they were more empathetic to somebody else's cause. Um, and so I, I do have, it's the only book actually that I've thought about possibly writing a sequel one day. And if I did, then I would bring some of these characters back because there are things that could have happened after this. You know, we, we don't know, we, I, I like to assume that everybody's gonna be okay. I think that's where we ended it. But will there maybe be some consequences to, you know, with, with Max Trevino, for example, you know, with him, the fact that he was okay um, having Ellis go pick up the daughter because it's not, not because he had really any compassion, sympathy for the girl, he doesn't know her, but he did think that it was better for his sister. Even he recognized that was really not the healthiest situation for his sister. Mm -hmm. So he was okay with protecting her. Um, but he didn't really envision her probably ending up in an asylum, you know? So, so there might be some, you know, Ellis probably doesn't have a job after this, you know, and he's going to have to build his way back. But I felt who he was now, he would be okay, that he would find his way and he would, you know, it, he would, he would find a job and he, you know, he, he'd be all right at the end. Um, but I have thought about if I ever wrote a sequel, um, I did have thoughts about it actually starring more of, um, now I got to think of what his name is. You'll know it before I do. It was, it was the love triangle. Oh, uh, I can't think of his name. Who can, who can name him? Who can name him? Clayton. Isn't Clayton, it? thank you. Yes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> You're a surprise. So yes. Oh, see quarantine brain. Um, so yes, Clayton, I, who I really liked myself too. You know, like I thought that he, that's another reason why I, I wrote a character that I thought he was a good choice too. Like I, um, didn't want to make it be that he was just this jerk and then she picks the good one, you know. Um, I thought that uh, that early in the book, if that had happened early on, that she would have chosen him. But who she was at the end of the book was not the same person. Mm -hmm. And um, and she was okay standing on her own too as being a single mother during that time period, which of course, you know, was not very popular. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, he would be one that I would be actually really interested to follow because I think his story would be interesting to see who he was and how he became the way he was too. Yeah, that's really interesting because we posed a question about Clayton, like, what did everybody think? Because I admitted I had a really hard time deciding what I thought about him. And it seemed like a lot of people who wrote in that post said the same thing. Like, I didn't want to like it or I thought he was going to be a jerk. And then he was so nice. Like, he really was a nice guy. He just wasn't that that guy. Right. And the fact that at that time period, he was willing to take on that son as, and treat him as his own and adopt him. And, you know, I, I thought that he was, I, I felt that he was a good person. You know, he just, but he's pretty arrogant, you know, and, um, and he has a lot to prove for different reasons that come out in the story. So the way that I tend to write all of my characters um, with every novel, so if you read my other books, you'll know that in the beginning, how you feel about them is very often different by the end of the book. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason I do this, I write them in such a way that I like to introduce them in such a way that just like you meet somebody. So someone you first meet in real life, you know, you don't know everything about their history and they may seem rude. We all know this, right? People who you haven't clicked with right away and you think, well, they seem kind of standoffish or a little rude or, you know, and then you find out you get to know them and you understand where it comes from. And it's, I think that's empathy, um, which is why I think books are so important. But 
um, you know, somebody cuts you off on the freeway, right? And they, you know, kind of give you hand gestures and you think, oh, what a jerk, you know, who did? And then you have to stop and go, but what has that person gone through today that made them feel that that was the expression they wanted to take, you know, because somebody who's really happy in their life and happy where they are and, you know, having a really good day is probably not going to do that. Um, and yeah. react and so strongly and so negatively and outwardly. So I tend to, I tend to think of it as like an onion. So hopefully you get, you know, the layers. And then when you get down to where it comes from, just like Ellis's father, you know, seeming pretty standoffish and pretty, you know, cold and not very approving and very hard to win his approval. And yet when you understand what he is dealing with and the guilt he is carrying around his whole life and not wanting to get close for very obvious reasons, especially during that time period, then I understood him more. Yeah, I think that's a great point. So knowing you were considering Clayton for a sequel, um, Leanne Meyer, who is my Jayhawk book club counterpart down there, um, asked with a sequel in mind, would it be based on a second photo? Oh, that's interesting. Very possibly, yes. Um, now it will, yes. <laughs> And if I do, I will put you in the acknowledgments, Leanne. So yes, like no royalties for you. So don't get too excited. <laughs> I'll get you her contact info. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's such a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I've never really seriously considered a sequel before. I've always liked to move on to something new. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, also because I usually used to write World War II. So after the end of the war, it's not quite as exciting, you know, or as romantic or whatever, you know, the stakes are not quite as high after world war. Um, and then you come back and go, you know, like now that the, now that the, you know, um, GI in his uniform is now, you know, selling, you know, a, like a brush salesman, you know, going door to door selling encyclopedias is not quite as exciting, you know, as the last book. So it, it, it never felt like the stakes were high enough to write a sequel. Um, but in this case, it's not World War. So it is definitely possible. Yeah, that's great. Yes, someone was saying how it would be interesting to see how he fared in Chicago. So a different yeah. city and you, that is where you used to live. Not in Chicago, no, um, but I have had novels. I've set several novels in Chicago. Okay. I love the I was... city. Um, yeah, but no, but you're close. Actually, when I think I, my husband got his master's at Notre Dame. And so we were very close to Notre, to uh, Chicago. You know, but we said when it's not football season at Notre Dame, the only thing really to do is to go to Chicago. <laughs> when you're not buried in 10 feet of snow from Lake Effect. So, um, so I would go to Chicago a lot and I love that city. And, and so, yeah, so. That's, yeah. that's why. But I did live outside of Philly for some time okay. with my husband. So both connections there. Um, and so, you know, my husband was working for Johnson, Johnson for time. And so we, and I was always telecommuting, so I could kind of move anywhere. And we lived outside of Philly. And if you're familiar with the area, we lived in Lansdale. And, um, and so I absolutely gained an appreciation for the city and thought it was, I've been asked a lot why I chose Philly, because that's not usually a city a lot of authors pick. You usually pick Chicago, New York. Yeah. Um, and the reason being is that I was familiar with the area and I felt like it was a city that wasn't written about as much um, that I've seen with historicals. And having that rich history was so fascinating to me with that city. You know, it has obviously, we all know, has such a huge history. Um, and then, but also at that time period during the Great Depression, imagine how at one point it was like, you know, it was the place to be. And then after, it was like considered at one point the textile mill of the country. And so you had so many plants and factories and and then with them all dying during the Great Depression when you don't have consumption I thought you know you have these you know all the smoke coming out you could just feel that it was dirtier and and getting becoming more poor and yet 45 minutes away I know that for a fact of driving there you know suddenly you're in just just fields and fields and farmlands and the dichotomy of that would be so interesting that you could drive just a short period even especially back then when it was less developed and have farmland out there and these kids that are having such a hard time and yet you know be right in the middle of the city i knew then that i wanted to put him at a newspaper there that then it would be a major city but to get to new york to get to the new york times to get to you know the herald tribune would be a huge step up that he wouldn't want to let go of yeah that's great insight so I want to give you some time to talk about, you know, this actual or maybe potentially staged photograph and, you know, the real story in your relationship with a very reliable source. 
behind this photo if you wanted to share that piece with us. Sure thing, yeah. I can't remember. I think we talked about this before, so I'm not sure how much, um, if you all have heard this story. Um, but so I will try to summarize it. And that is that, so Rayanne and I became friends after I wrote the book, uh, you know, reached out to her on Facebook and thankfully, you know, like I've laughed about that before as far as like with Lisa Wingate or Christina Baker Klein and we think, not not everybody wants to hear from you, you know, that you say, so I saw this photo of you as a kid with this horrific picture being sold, you know, like, I'm going to tell you I wrote a book. <laughs> not everybody's going to celebrate that phone call. Um, luckily, I did reach out to her because I, I knew the book started gaining buzz and I thought, you know, NPR had asked if I had reached out to the family. And of course I wanted to for a long time. I also knew that I wrote a fictionalized story. This was completely inspired by the photo, but as you all know, it was not their book or I, their story, or I absolutely would have been in touch with them the entire time. So I thought, you know what? I really would love to reach out to them. So I did. And luckily, yeah, we hit it off immediately and became friends and, and we ended up going on um, Megan Kelly's Today Show uh, two years ago. And I, I tell, I'll tell you all again now, we were on the very last segment of the very last show, but we had nothing to do with anything <laughs> going wrong. So I always I say, tell everybody, our book is now a collector's item. So it should be worth double if you resell yours, just so you know. Um, so Ray and I and, uh, became friends. We ended up meeting on the show in person. And the reason for that was because of this. Um, on our very first phone call, she shared that during her time on the farm, which was just as even more horrific than what I put in the novel. So with the Calvin being chained up in the barn, all of that was their story, um, horrifically. So if the, the, we'll call them the foster parents uh, that had them because she doesn't think, she doesn't think that they were legally adopted. Uh, so when they took care of them there, if they thought they uh, needed disciplined or were afraid they might run away, they would tie them up in the barn. And so she and I talked about that and she said, you know, I grew up there and we were slave labor to them. That's exactly why they bought us for $2. Um, you know, she was $2, her brother came along for free, of course, right? And her mother said, I'm gonna use the money to play bingo. So of course that was not the compassionate story that I thought that I was hoping to uncover, thinking that maybe there was more to the story. Maybe there was a, a child, you know, in the house that was sick and they couldn't afford to and to feed the other children. And so they accepted money because of it. And that, of course, that's part of the impetus of writing sold on a Monday was after, especially after learning the truth, I wanted to give these children the mother they deserved. I thought um, to go through the same actions, but for very different reasons and to have an ending that I wish the real children had had with the right mother. Um, but the kids ended up getting all separated, sold, et cetera. And what Rayanne shared was that when she was 16 years old, was dropped off at a football game by the foster mother and said, good luck, find your way home. So you can imagine how far that walk is and at night with no lights. Um, and she did the walk home and that's where she was picked up on the way back by a drunken father from a neighboring town who picked her up and held her for some time and she was sexually assaulted. And because of that, she became pregnant and had that baby at a, an unwed mother's home um, that was run by the Salvation Army. And so that was all in Michigan. So had the child, begged to keep the child, really at 17, wanted something of her own, wanted a child that she said would always know she was loved and wanted unlike herself. And so her foster mother said, okay, fine, you can keep the baby as long as you name her after me. Now, we can all agree that that's not normal. Um, and obviously there are issues there, but Rayanne said, it's a small concession. She named her Ruthie after Ruth, brought the baby home six months later. Um, baby's beautiful, healthy, and the foster mother invited some women into the house, the farmhouse one day, and they start kind of going through the baby clothes. And then next thing you know, foster mother says, hand over the child, one of them wants to hold her. So she didn't know any better at 17 and hands the baby and they walked out the door. And she never got to say goodbye. And she, you know, and she, soon after that, she never knew where they went. And soon after that, she left the farm and never came back. So that's where she asked me if there's any chance that you can help me find my daughter. I really, you know, love her to know how much I love her before I die. So, so we started on the the DNA hunt and all that. You know, I said 
I think I told you, can I, can I send you a DNA kit? Have you done that before? And she said, said, well, you know, no, I've never done that before. I've always wanted to. And I said, well, you know, I watched 2020, right? And that's how they always do it. So <laughs> let's go. So we've done a couple of those. And, um, and so that's why we went on the show to do sort of a call out. And so we're, we're still working on it. And you know, I've, I've gone through the Salvation Army archives and, you know, we're, we're trying the best we can. Unfortunately, at the time, you know, we think that there's a very low chance that anything was ever put on paper. Um, probably a very low chance that the baby knew it was adopted, that she knew she was adopted. So, so there's that. So you kind of hope then that eventually there's enough people that do sort of the, the DNA testing that can make the connections that there, that might be a, um, a, a you know, a, a daughter or something that's connected to, to her own daughter that might lead us back. So please, you know, send good thoughts and, and hopefully we'll have a really good ending to that story. Yeah, I think that is an incredible, I mean, if you were to write about that, it would have been amazing. But I mean, the way that you told that story and then connected with her afterward is just totally fascinating. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, amazing. And, and she's amazing in herself too. I will add in that, um, that obviously anybody that goes through those kind of traumas, as we all know, can either end up, can break a person very, especially as a child, you know, I mean, um, she had no reason really to come out of that and be a warm, giving, loving person. Um, but she did exact opposite. You know, she decided that she was going to be the exact opposite of everything she was raised with. So she, you know, when I, um, now health reasons keep her from doing some of this, but, but she was, you know, for a long time, a volunteer for Meals and Wheels and, and, um, is, you know, very much part of the community and loves her bingo nights and, you know, ironically. Um, but yeah, but she's, she's the sweetest person you can ever imagine. So. Yeah. Well, it's nice for you to go out and share that story. And I think it just takes one person to hear it, to think of something strange that they heard once. I think stranger things have happened. So making those connections with all of these different book clubs and sharing her story and that she's willing to let you share that story, I think is really powerful. Yeah, it's amazing. And she's a living example of, you know, I write fiction based on real people that make it, uh, you know, ordinary people that make it through, ex you know, extraordinary circumstances and become stronger and hopefully full of hope, hopefully by the end of the story. Um, but she is absolutely, you know, a living example of someone who's gone through hardships, harder things than I can ever fathom and, and still come out, obviously not just okay, but, um, but a strong person on the other side and very loving and compassionate person. Right. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, someone in the chat, Christina, be sure to look. Someone shared a genealogy library for, for some further research for oh, you. And thank you, thank you. I will. I'll yeah. definitely look at that. Thank you. Yeah, we've done um, 23 and Me, and uh, so I'll and then so yes, whoever it is. If, oh, here we go. Okay, and then okay, good. I'm copying. There we go. Okay, I will paste as soon as we're done. <laughs> Yeah, there, and there are a couple of more comments kind of making connections between their stories. And so I kind of just want to, I think that was really the last piece that I wanted Christina to be able to share with you all. So if people do want to un unmute and ask questions or share anything with her, I think now is the time to do that. Maybe question. I know I covered a lot. <laughs> You're probably all, I know it's, even Rayanne's last story takes, uh, you know, always take, it's a lot to process in just a few sentences. It's, it's yeah. a pretty big story. Okay. Before we go to, I can also, if you're thinking right now, I can, um, I'll mention very briefly, um, usually I'm asking you what, what I'm working on next, which as you know, authors, we always joke that, you know, that we like, especially when they ask us right after the book is published, anything, you know, it's, it's, I always equate it to, you know, we're like, we're in the hospital, we just had the baby, and people can be like, oh, it's so cute, you know, you hope every, people don't call your baby ugly, you know, once <laughs> you put it out in the world, um, and then they say, when's the next one, you know, <laughs> Dude, calm down, um, so, but I, but I've had a little break, I did off and on tour for eight months, which I think broke all kinds of insane records. There's a good reason people don't tour for eight months. Um, so I did 75 events around the country, just all over the place. And my family is the village and, you know, they completely supported it. And we're so excited with how, book, how well the book did. Um, we just passed 600,000 copies sold, which is insane. Um, when I also, because thank you. And I, I share that because um, right before the book came out, I had a day of, the closest thing that I've ever had of anxiety of my chest felt tight. It was hard to breathe. I called my husband and I said, 
I think this book is going to bomb. I think this was a big mistake. I think I should have written it with the trend, which is what everybody else, you know, would, in the right mind would probably do, which was the easiest route would have been write it from the kid's point of view. You know, and I thought I should have just done that. I shouldn't. No, no, no. And I said, I'm going to write the next book as fast as possible so we can all forget this ever happened. And of course, you know, <laughs> so the fact that I'm actually really excited about my next book is maybe a bad sign. <laughs> so at least I know I'll be excited. Hopefully you guys will read it and at least like it. Um, so the next book right now is called The Vanishing Game. We'll see if it stays that way. But, um, you know, if you, if you like it, then nod, you know, like, okay, if you don't like it, don't tell me, but um, we'll find out if it stays. Um, the only thing I can tell you so far, oh, I'm dying to tell you so much about it, um, but because it's a new shiny toy, the only thing I will share is that it is set during World War II, which I kept saying I'd never go back to World War II, every book I say this, unless, any time period, unless I have something new to say and that I haven't seen written anywhere else. Um, so I had an article and, and I think it was, it was in my files of, oh, cool, World War II fact. I'd never heard of that before. That's crazy. But I didn't think it was a whole novel. So I saved it for years and years. And as I was desperate for new story ideas, um, went through my old files and all of a sudden two articles, that and actually a photo, maybe from the same 50 shocking photos, you know, clickbait. I think it was one of those I saved and it ended up, I thought, oh my gosh, this is the same story. And the, what I can share with you so far is that there was a group of secret British military intelligence during World War II that I have never heard of. Um, other author friends who are amazing at writing World War II, you know, Kate Quinn, who wrote The Alice Network, um, is one of my, you know, she's a good friend of mine. And she's one of my go-tos that when I go to her and she's never heard of it, I know I'm in really good shape. And it is this group. And the only thing I can tell you is that they were so specialized in what they did and successful that they only existed during World War II. And afterwards, they were disbanded and told to not talk about it. Um, some of the tactics that they used were so unique and, um, and that they ended up keeping them classified until the 1985. And it's because they thought since they weren't discovered and they were so good, they thought they might use them again uh, during the Cold War. And so it wasn't declassified until just, you know, a handful of years ago. Um, but I can tell you that the things that they used are things that you all grew up with as kids and you have no idea they used them the way they did. Cool. Oh, how's that for a <laughs> That's where I want to go subscribe down below. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> like pre-order. Um, yeah, so I can't wait. I'm a two thirds through and it's supposed to be, we'll see how it goes because life is, you know, insane for all of us. Um, but it's supposed to be out next, end of next August, as long as I, you know, don't, don't Zoom chat with all kinds of fun people like you on a daily basis. You know, hopefully the book will get written. Well, we are honored that you would share the title and a question that came out of our, our downtime here was, how did you come up with the title of this? Why Monday? Yeah. Okay. So good question. So school on <laughs> Monday. this is funny. Okay. You'll laugh at this. So um, where the title came from, we brainstormed a billion bazillion titles and, um, and it, some good ones, but not one that we were like, that makes it different than any other book that's out there. Um, mm -hmm. Also one that's only a few words that are words that we're all very familiar with. It's, it's interesting when you break down titles and when they said, yeah, the best ones are ones that have nouns. <laughs> and there are things, words that we're already familiar with, but put in an unusual way. And so you go, oh, that's interesting. So, right, so when you start thinking about titles, it, it versus, you know, ones that are very popular books can have crazy titles, but they're harder to remember. You know, you kind of go, it's that book, it's something about poison wood, you know, or it's something about, um, you know, like um, it's about literary potato peel, you know, kind of, you know, and so they're harder to remember, but you kind of get the gist. Um, in this case, it's so easy to remember. And that was one thing that we loved about it. Where the title came from is at the very last second before we needed the title, for sure. My editor ended up, uh, we emailed back and forth. And, and what she said is at one point, she was, what if we go a completely different way? She said, I remember Chris, at one point I wrote after, I wrote a good portion of the book. Um, at one point I thought, what if I did a prologue that was from the kid's point of view? And I actually wrote it from the little girl, from Ruby's point of view. And it started with, I was sold on a Tuesday, was the first sentence. And I wrote two paragraphs 
of the day that she was sold. And then I thought, if I did that, I do an epilogue then. But then after I wrote it, I went, it's really powerful and I love a good first sentence. Um, but I thought it's a great first sentence. It's very powerful. It's memorable. I'd keep reading. Mm -hmm. However, I thought that's very misleading. I thought to the reader to, I would be felt like I would be misled that you get an, a prologue is from the kid's point of view and you never come back to that again until the end of the book. I thought, okay, that's a different book than I thought I was signing on for. Yeah. So I thought that that might be not the way to write the way to go. So I, I scrapped it, but she remembered that I was thinking about it at one point. And she said, you know, you wrote that prologue at one point that said I was sold on a Monday. She goes, what if we went sold on a Monday? And I didn't have the heart to tell her it was actually Tuesday because I thought, ooh, Monday has a better ring to it. <laughs> so it's true, right? Sold on a Tuesday does not sound as good. So I went, oh yeah, that's it. And I had thought of calling it sold at one point and I actually had thought of calling it something like that. And I, I never volunteered it to her because I thought, well, maybe not. You know, I had self doubt. And it was great because it was something I'd considered and she put it on email. I'm like, yes, 100%. So that's where it came from. And then of course, as you know, throughout the book, then when, when you find out that Ellis, you know, could have sold more than that, what did he sell on that Monday? He sold his integrity. He sold, you know, there are a lot of things that, right, that we kind of put, you know, you give up just a little bit, give up just a little bit and suddenly you've crossed over a line that you didn't anticipate. Yeah, that's really interesting. Thank you for sharing the thought process. It's fascinating. Of course. The other thing I'll share too that, um, that I haven't shared in a while is that the cover, um, which I love so very much because I think it captures the feel of the book, um, is that the little boy, this is pretty neat, when I first got the cover and fell in love with it, um, it was the second cover I was given. The first one had, now that you've read the book, I can share, two little kids, a little girl and a, and a little boy that were skipping together, um, wearing wealthy British school clothing on a railroad track. Um, so I think we can all hopefully collectively agree that's not the right choice for this book. <laughs> I mean, thank you. I, I went, my kids looked at it and stopped and went, why are they skipping? And, um, and so I showed it to friends who hadn't read my story because they said, what would you think this is? A, would you pick this up? And they said, oh, I definitely picked that up. Okay, well, that's good. Maybe I'm being too harsh. What would you think the story's about? It looks like they were sold on a Monday and they were so happy about it. Like they got sold into a happy family. <laughs> And in like England, and I'm like, okay, no, so much no. Um, so no, they're not happy about being sold. And, you know, and it was a spoiler to have the girl on the front, of course, as well. So I thought, you know, yeah, that's all gotta go. So thankfully, my publisher listened, they were great, and said, well, what about this? And I said, 100% yes, um, could not have picked a better picture. And, and then uh, ended up posting it on Facebook. I was very excited when I got the cover finalized. And I had a photographer reach out to me that said, I just have to tell you that I took that photo and I'm so excited that it's, she does ones for covers um, very often. And she said, I, but she photographs children um, specifically and they're beautiful. They're like works of art. And she said, I have to tell you that I'm especially excited because that's my son on the cover. And she said, I took him back. I think she uh, lives in the Ukraine and she went to visit her parents, I believe in Israel. And she said, when we went back to visit my parents on the farm I grew up on, I knew I wanted to take that photo of my son. I pictured it before we went and I, I brought the clothes and I borrowed my dad's suitcase that he had had since he was a kid. Wow. And so all of that on there is very authentic and, and took a picture of her childhood field. So that's, so she said it meant a lot to her because it was very personal, which I loved. That's really incredible. How neat. Um, I have to bring this up. I know that people might need to drop off and you do what you need to do, but this is fascinating to me because I definitely didn't realize this, but someone said, am I the only one that assumed incorrectly that the prologue was written from Ellis's point of view? And several others chimed in and said that they thought that too. And I had not realized it until this moment. Yeah, I wrote it uh, specifically hoping um, that it could be read either way. And I definitely um, wanted, was hoping to make it so that the reader would think that it, assume that it's from Ellis. And especially because, you know, it's written in first, in first person, so you don't know, but making that person a reporter, making, you know, all these things that, um, that could definitely lead you to think that it's him. And I was hoping then that throughout the story, you would wonder, then you start wondering which one it is, I had hoped and not know really you know, who was the one that was hurt and who was the one that was okay and, um, until the end. So that would be a question. I was hoping that you wouldn't get fully answered until the, until the end. Um, I also knew that the beginning of 
the book to me um, is I, I I think I may have told you I consider it like a roller coaster and that you kind of I think the part one to me is it's, it's um, the setup that you know that I think you need all of that for the payoff of what you understand about these characters by the end and understand why they make the choices they do or they would seem very unethical mm -hmm. um, and so it, to me part one is like a click 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 is how my husband calls it you know it's like the click 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 and then part two starts going and then of course part three doesn't stop until you like you know screech into the end of, of the roller coaster and um, but without having that beginning, you know, you don't understand these people and why they're doing what they do. So yeah, so that's what I, I consider that one. But yeah, so that that prologue was definitely meant for that for exactly. And I will say with the um, the audiobook, if anybody listened to that, um, they had asked me if I, you know, they were looking for voices and whatnot and getting my opinion. And I said the only thing that I will request is that if you have only one reader, is that it is all read by a man. Because most of it is, you know, because you have Ellis, to me, is one of the, the really, you know, driving force. But then also because that prologue, you will assume that it's from his point of view throughout most of the book. Yeah, that's so interesting. <laughs> I really am glad that someone brought that up. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, is there anyone else who has final burning questions? Now's your time. Look at all the, it's a one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> here for you <laughs> you're like and then there were 17. <laughs> okay well thank right. you so much christina this was such a treat for everybody oh thank you thanks for having me and guys thank you so much for reading and i can't tell you how much that means especially you know from somebody who had anxiety <laughs> over this book to know that you all took the time to read a story from me really really means a lot so thank you and thanks for coming to chat about it well, and be sure to go to the chat. We can leave on someone's comment that said they chose Sold on a Monday for two other book clubs and everyone loved it. So thank you so <laughs> much for more if you missed anything. But thanks everybody for coming and thank you, Christina. This was so nice. Thanks everybody. Everybody stay safe and well and and keep reading and and um hopefully we'll see you guys again. Yes, okay. that would be great. Okay, thanks. Bye, everybody. Uh, bye, everybody. Hey, guys. Have a great night. Bye. Thanks, Michelle, for everything. Thank you for hosting. Live on Facebook. <laughs> yeah. Bye, bye, everyone. Bye for now. Bye. <laughs> bye, Amanda. Thanks for your question. <laughs>